Hello, my name is Vladik Ananov, and when I was nine years old, I had a dream to create my own computer games, so I've learned to code. Since then, I didn't try any games whatsoever, but somehow I ended up battling and taming the complexities of enterprise software. In fact, I've got so fascinated by it that I've been doing it for the last 18 years. Currently, I serve as the chief architect for a company called Internobus. The peculiar thing about Internobus is that we've been using domain-driven design since the day the company was founded. And I'm here today to share with you our DDD journey. So what's in front of us? In the first part of this presentation, I'll walk you through the various systems from our domain and how we've implemented them. Of course, I won't be able to cover everything we've done. Therefore, I'll concentrate on five bounded contexts that demonstrate the different approaches to DDD that we've tried and the result that we achieved. In the second part, I will use those five stories to share some practical advice on DDD, Securus, event sourcing, and microservices. So about seven years ago, I've got a phone call from a friend. He said that he was starting a new company. The business was not going to be simple, but if I joined him, Technically, I could do whatever I wanted. And since back then I had a pretty boring job, I've agreed just like that. Let me show you what I've got myself into. Let's say you're producing a product or a service. Internobus allows you to outsource all your marketing-related chores. We'll come up with the best marketing strategy for your product. Our copywriters and graphic <coughs> designers will produce tons of creative materials, such as banners and landing pages that will be used to run campaigns to promote your product. All the leads generated by these campaigns are going to be handled by our own sales agents who will make the calls and sell your products. And, of course, most importantly, this whole process provides many opportunities for optimization. And that's exactly what our analysis department is doing. They are going to analyze the data to make sure that you are getting the biggest bang for a buck, whether it's by pinpointing the most effective creatives, most successful campaigns, or by making sure that the agents are working the most promising leads. That's the system that I signed up to build. Since we were a self-funded company, we had to get rolling as fast as possible. So we started by implementing the first third of our value chain. We had to provide a way for media buyers to manage contracts with various <coughs> publishers, a catalog for designers to manage their creatives, and of course, the campaign management solution to run advertising campaigns, which meant not only a management system, but an ad serving and hosting solution as well. Now, I don't know about you, but all these business domains initially sounded terribly complex to me. Fortunately, not long before we started working, I read a book with the words software and complexity in its title. Maybe you've even heard about it. It wasn't an easy book to read, but luckily for me, I thought that I've got a really strong grasp of domain-driven design just by reading the first four chapters. <laughs> Guess how the system was initially designed? Its architectural style could be neatly summarized as aggregates everywhere. Creative, agency, advertiser, publisher, website placement, each and every now in the requirements was proclaimed as an aggregate. And all those so-called aggregates resided in a huge loan bonded context. Yeah, exactly the <coughs> same monolith that everyone warns you about nowadays. And of course, those were no aggregates, just an anemic domain model. They didn't provide any transactional boundaries and they had very little behavior in them. All the behavior was here, in a big, fat service layer. Frankly, this design is no work of art, right? By any means. This design is like by the book example of what domain-driven design is not, how not to do domain-driven design. However, things looked quite different from the business standpoint. From their point of view, this project was considered a huge success. Despite the imperfect architecture and despite our very unique approach to QA, we delivered working software in a very aggressive time to market. How did that happen? 
And the answer is ubiquitous language. We somehow managed to come up with a robust ubiquitous language. None of us had any prior experience in online marketing, but nevertheless, we could still hold a conversation with domain experts. We understood them, and they understood us. And to our astonishment, domain experts turned out to be very nice people. <laughs> they really enjoyed and appreciated the fact that we were willing to learn from them and their experience. And this smooth communication allowed us to grasp the business domain very quickly and to implement its logic. Again, yes, it was a very big, scary monolith, but for two developers in a garage, it was probably good enough. Again, working software in a very aggressive time to market. This diagram sums up our understanding of DDD at this stage, ubiquitous language, and an anemic domain model in a monolithic bounded context. As time passed, leads started flowing in, and we were in a rush. Our sales agents needed a robust CRM customer relations management system to work with. The CRM had to aggregate all incoming leads, group them based on various parameters such as target markets, countries, brands, stuff like that, and distribute th those leads across multiple sales desks around the globe. It also had to integrate with our clients' internal systems, both to complement our leads with additional information and to notify the clients about changes in the leads' <coughs> life cycles. And of course, the CRM had to provide as many optimization opportunities as possible. For example, we needed the ability to make sure that agents are working on the most promising leads, to assign leads to agents based on their past performance and qualifications, and to allow a very flexible solution for calculating agents' commissions. Since all these requirements didn't quite fit any existing off-the-shelf products, we decided to roll out our own CRM system. <coughs> our initial implementation approach was the good old DDD Lite. We'll call every noun and aggregate and shoehorn them into the same huge monolith. This time, however, something felt wrong right from the start. We noticed that all too often we were adding awkward prefixes to aggregates' names, like CRM lead and marketing lead, marketing campaign and CRM campaign. And interestingly, <coughs> we never used those prefixes in conversations with domain experts. Somehow, they always understood the meaning from the context. And then I recall that there was a chapter with something about contexts in that big blue book. So I went back and this time I read the book cover to cover. I learned that bounded contexts solve exactly the same issue that we had experienced. They protect consistency of the language. Also, by the time von Vernon's book came out, I read it and I finally understood that Aggregates aren't just data structures, but they play a much more important role by protecting consistency of the data. So we took a step back and redesigned the CRM solution to reflect those revelations. First of all, we divided our monolith into two distinct bounded contexts, <coughs> marketing and CRM. We didn't go crazy with microservices here or anything like that. We just did the bare minimum required to protect our ubiquitous language. However, in this new bounded context, we were not going to repeat the same mistakes we did in the marketing context. No more anemic <coughs> domain models. Here, we will implement a real domain model with real by-the-book aggregates. In particular, we promise that each transaction will affect only one instance of an aggregate. Instead of an ORM, the aggregate itself will manage its transactional scope, and the service layer will go on a very strict diet, and all the business logic will be moved into its corresponding aggregates. We were so enthusiastic about doing things the right way, but soon enough, it became apparent that modeling a proper domain model is damn hard. <coughs> Relative to marketing context, everything took way more time. It was almost impossible to get the transactional boundaries right the first time. 
we always had to evaluate at least a few models, test them out, only to figure out that the model that we hadn't thought about before was the correct one. The price of doing things the right way was very high for us, a lot of time. And sooner than later, it became obvious to everyone. We are not going to meet the deadlines. And then the management decided to help us. They offloaded implementation of some of the features to DBAs. Yeah, store procedures. <laughs> this decision did so much damage. Not because SQL is not the best language for describing business logic. The real issue was a bit more subtle. This situation produced an implicit bounded context with the boundary dissecting one of our most complex business entities, the lead. The result was two teams working on the same business component, implementing closely related features with minimal <coughs> interaction between them. And of course, there was no ubiquitous language. Literally, each team had its own vocabulary to describe the business domain and its rules. The Conway's law kicked our asses. The models were inconsistent, there was, there was no shared understanding, knowledge was duplicated, the same business rules implemented twice, here and there, and rest assured, when the logic had to change, the implementations went out of sync just like that. <coughs> Total nightmare. Needless to say, the project wasn't delivered anywhere near on time, it was full of bugs, nasty production issues that had flown under the radar for years, corrupting our most precious asset our data. The only solution for fixing this mess was to completely throw away the old implementation and rewrite the lead aggregate from scratch, this time of course in proper boundaries, which we did a couple of years later. It wasn't easy, but the mess was so bad there was no other way around it. So to sum, sum it up, at this stage our understanding of domain driven design looked like this. Ubiquitous language, bounded context to protect the integrity of the language, and instead of an anemic domain model everywhere, a proper domain model everywhere. Of course, a crucial part of DDD is missing here, subdomains and their effect on implementation strategy. Initially, we wanted to do the best job possible, but we ended up wasting time and effort on building domain models for supporting subdomains. As Eric Evans put it, not all of a large system will be well designed, and we learned it the hard way, and wanted to use the acquired knowledge in our next project. After the CRM was rolled out, we noticed that there was an implicit domain spread across the marketing and CRM. Whenever the process of handling incoming customer events was modified, we had to introduce changes both in marketing and CRM. And since conceptually this process didn't belong to any of them, we've decided to extract this logic into its own dedicated bounded context. We called it event crunchers. Since we didn't make any money out of the way we move data around, and we couldn't use an off-the-shelf solution here, it looked pretty much like a vanilla supporting subdomain. And we designed it as such. <coughs> Nothing fancy this time, just some simple ETA-like transaction scripts. And this solution worked well for a while. As our business evolved, we implemented more and more features right here. BI people asked us for some flags, a flag to mark a new customer, a flag to mark a new lead for a specific brand, etc., etc. And <coughs> eventually those simple flags have evolved into real business logic with complex rules and invariants. And guess what happens when you implement a complex business logic as an ETL script? This happens. What started out as an ETL script grew up to be a fully fledged core domain. And since we didn't adapt our implementation strategy, we ended up with a very big ball of mud. Each modification to this code base became more and more expensive. Quality went downhill, 
and we were forced to rethink our implementation. We did it a year later. The business logic grew so complex it could only be tackled with event sourcing. So we refactored this code into an event source domain model with other bounded contexts subscribing to its events. And we also had a very similar experience in another project. One day, sales desk managers had asked us to automate a simple yet tedious procedure that until then they've been doing manually, calculating commissions for sales agents. And again, it started pretty simple. Once a month, just calculate a percentage of each agent's sales and send the payment reports to the managers. As before, we contemplated whether or not this was our core domain. And the answer was no. We are not inventing something new here. We are not making money out of this process. And if there was an option to buy an existing implementation, we definitely would. Not core, not generic, but a typical supporting subdomain. Therefore, again, we didn't go crazy over its design. Active record objects orchestrated by a FETI service layer. But once this process became automated, boy did everyone become creative about it. Our analysts wanted to optimize the shit out of it. So they said, let's try out different percentages and make those percentages a function of number of sales and sales amounts and then both and then, then unlock some jackpot percentage if some business criteria was met, etc., etc. <coughs> Guess when this implementation has broke down? And it did break down. Again, the code base became a ball of mud. Adding new features turned out to be very expensive. Bugs started to appear, and when you are dealing directly with money, even the smallest bug can have some very big outcomes. Ask me how I know. As with crunchers, at some point we couldn't bear it anymore. We had to completely throw away the old code and rewrite it from ground up. This time as an event source domain model. Now, let's see what happened here. Just as in the event crunchers project, the business domain was initially categorized as a supporting one. But as the system evolved, it gradually mutated into a core domain. We found ways of making money out of these processes. However, there's a striking difference between these two bounded contexts. For the bonuses, we had a ubiquitous language. Even though the initial implementation was based on active records, we could still have a ubiquitous language. No, CRUD is not a bad word if your domain experts are using it. But as the complexity grew, the language got more and more complicated as well. And it could no longer be modeled using active records. And this allowed us to notice the need for a change in the implementation strategy much earlier than the case of crunchers. We saved a lot of time here by not trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, thanks to the ubiquitous language. That's what our vision of DAD looked like at this point, pretty much a classic one. Ubiquitous language, bound context, different domain types, and implementation strategies depend on the type of the business domain. <coughs> the fifth bound context that I want to talk about was called Marketing Hub. <coughs> our management was looking for a profitable new vertical. So they pondered why couldn't we use our ability to generate massive amounts of leads and sell them to smaller clients, ones that we didn't work with before. So they decided to give it a try. And this project was called Marketing Hub. Since this domain was defined as a new profit opportunity by the business, it was clearly a core business domain. Therefore, design-wise, we pulled out our heavy artillery here. Event source domain model, CQRS, and back then, one buzzword started gaining a lot of traction, microservices. So we decided to give it a try. That's what our solution looked like. Small services, each had its own database, both synchronous and asynchronous communication between them. On paper, we expected it to be a work of art. In practice, as always, not so fast. We naively approached microservices thinking that the smaller the services, the better. 
So we drew boundaries around the aggregates. In DDD lingo, each aggregate became a bounded context of its own. Again, initially it looked great. It allowed us to implement each service according to its specific needs. Only one would be used in event sourcing and the rest will be state-based aggregates. And of course, all of them could be maintained and evolved independently. However, as the system grew, services became more and more chatty. Almost each of them needed data from all other services to complete some of its operations. The result? What was intended to be a decoupled system ended up being a distributed monolith. An absolute nightmare to maintain. And there was another issue we had experienced with this architecture. We had used the most complex patterns for modeling the business logic, event sourcing and domain model. We carefully crafted all those services, but it all was in vain. Behind this complex architecture stood a very simple business logic. So simple, it could have been implemented using active records. Despite the fact that it was considered a core domain by the business, it had no technical complexity in it. it turned out the business was looking to make money not by clever algorithms, but by leveraging our existing relationships with other companies. And when this, when technical business complexities differ greatly, it's called accidental complexity. And this architecture ended up being exactly that, accidental complexity. The system was over-engineered. So those are the five bond contacts that I wanted to tell you about. Marketing, CRM, event crunchers, bonuses, and marketing hub. <coughs> now, it might hear like we are a bunch of losers who cannot get anything done right. <laughs> but again, I wanted to share stories of most problematic parts of our system that we learned from. So let's see what we've learned from this experience. First and foremost, ubiquitous language. I believe that ubiquitous language is the most important part of domain dreaming design. This is the core domain of DDD. The ability to speak the same language with domain experts proved to be indispensable for us. It turned out to be a much more effective way to share knowledge than documents, tests, and even JIRA. And more than that, the ability to hold a conversation with domain experts for us was a major predictor of project success like in our marketing context. When we just started, our implementation was far from perfect, but the robust ubiquitous language compensated for the architectural shortcomings. We were able to deliver the project's goals. In the CRM context, we screwed it up. Unintentionally, we had two languages describing the same business domain. This led to lots of problems, and even though we've tried to have a proper design here, because of the communication issues, we ended up with a huge mess. The Event Crunches project started as a simple supporting subdomain, so we didn't invest in the ubiquitous language. But when the complexity started growing, we regretted the decision big time. Even though we had to redesign the project, it would have taken us much less time had we initially started with the ubiquitous language, like we did in the bonuses project. Here, the business logic became orders of magnitude more complex, but the ubiquitous language allowed us to <coughs> notice the need for a change in the implementation <coughs> strategy much earlier. And speaking of supporting subdomains, it doesn't really matter what kind of business domain you are working on, core, supporting, or even generic. Our take on it right now is that ubiquitous, ubiquitous language is not optional for any of them. We also learned to invest in the ubiquitous language early on. <coughs> From our experience in the CRM context, it is practically impossible to fix a language if it has been spoken for a while in a company. We were able to fix our implementation here. It wasn't easy, but eventually we did it. But that's not the case for the language. To this day, some people still use the conflicting terms that were defined in the initial implementation. Also, if you take care of the ubiquitous language early enough, it's very cheap. Many have the impression that 
it will be expensive to allocate domain experts time for interaction with IT people. Not true, at least in our case. Domain experts are sick and tired of software engineers trying to act as if they know better how to solve problems in domains they have no experience in. That's why our domain experts were so cooperative and willing to help. So you don't need a budget for a ubiquitous language. At most, a cup of coffee will do the job. Next, domain types. We all know that according to DDD, there are three types of business domains. Core domain, the stuff you do differently from your competitors to gain competitive advantage. Supporting domains, the stuff you do differently from others, but it doesn't provide any competitive edge. And generic domains, the stuff that everyone is doing the same way. It's common practice to use this categorization to drive design decisions. For core domains, use the heavy artillery, domain model or event sourcing. Supporting domains can be implemented with some rapid application development framework. And generic domains, in most cases, are cheaper to buy than to implement yourself. However, for us, there was a problem with this model. Companies, and especially startups like ours, tend to change and reinvent themselves over time. Businesses evolve, new profit sources are evaluated, others neglected, and sometimes unexpected opportunities are discovered. As a result, business domain types change accordingly. Speaking of our company, I think I've experienced almost all the possible combinations of such changes. For example, event crunchers and bonuses. Both of them started as supporting domains, but once we discovered ways of making money out of these processes, they became our core domains. In the marketing context, we implemented our own creative catalog. Nothing special or complex about it. However, a few years later, an open source project came out and it offered exactly the same functionality that we had and even a bit more. So we threw out our implementation and replaced it with this product. What happened here? A supporting domain became a generic one. In the CRM context, we had an algorithm that evaluated and identified the most promising leads. We refined it over time, tried various implementations, but eventually replaced it with a fully managed machine learning model running on AWS. A core domain became a generic domain. We also seen our marketing hub context. What started as a core domain ended up being a supporting domain since the competitive edge resided in a completely different dimension. And we have quite a few examples in our industry of companies that turned generic and supporting domains into their core business. For example, Amazon and their <coughs> AWS cloud. Now, once this kind of change happens, your design should evolve accordingly. Failing to do so in time will lead to lots of accidental complexities. Hence, instead of making design decisions based on domain types, today we prefer to reverse this relationship. For each domain, we, decide, we design its implementation strategy first. No gold plating here. The simplest design that will do the job. And from this design, we deduce the domain's type. This approach has multiple benefits. The first one is less waste. The implementation is driven by the requirements at hand. It's not going to be over-engineered, as it happened for us in the marketing hub context. And it's going to, not going to be under-engineered, as we did in the bonuses context. Second, reversing this relationship creates a dialogue between you and the business. And sometimes business people need you as much as you need them. Because if they think that something is a core business, but you can hack it in a day with a small Ruby on Rails project, then probably some questions should be raised about the business. On the other hand, what if a domain is considered as a supporting by the business, but it could only be implemented with a domain model or even event sourcing? 
That's where things get interesting. There are two options. First, maybe the business people got over creative with the requirements and ended up with accidental business complexity. It happens. In such case, the requirements can and should be simplified. This domain brings no competitive advantage, so there is no business value in implementing it in this complex way. <coughs> On the other hand, it might be that the business can employ this domain to gain an additional competitive edge, as it happened with our bonuses module. In such a case, you're helping the business to identify new profit opportunities much faster. And by the way, designing the implementation strategy is pretty simple. We have a couple of very simple heuristics that allow us to streamline this decision-making process. The most important question you have to answer here is how should the business logic be modeled in code? We have four options, four patterns. Transaction script, active record, domain model, and an event source domain model. You can decide which of these patterns you should use by answering a few questions. First, does the domain in question deal with money directly? Does it require deep analytics or require an audit log by law? If the answer is yes, use the event source domain model. Second, how complex is the business logic? Is it more complex than some input validations? Does it have complicated business rules and invariants? If it does, use domain model. Third, if on the other hand, the business logic is simple, then how complex are the data structures? If you've got some complicated object trees, go with active record. And lastly, if the answers to all those questions were negative, use a simple transaction script. Once you've decided which of these patterns to use, it becomes a trivial job to map a, a suitable architectural pattern. In most cases, event sourcing requires CQRS. Domain model requires hexagonal architecture. Use layered architecture for active record. And for transaction script, in many cases, you can even do away without layers. However, there is one exception here in this slide, and that's CQRS. CQRS can be very useful not only for event sourcing, but for any of these patterns, and I'll get back to this topic in a minute. Now, let's say you've chosen an implementation strategy, but over time, it started breaking under its own weight. For example, you've been using the active record pattern, but maintaining and modifying the business logic <coughs> became painful. This pain is a very important signal. Use it. It means that the domain has evolved. It very well might be that it's time to go back and rethink its type and implementation strategy. If the type has changed, talk with the domain experts to understand the business context. If you need to redesign the implementation to, be, to meet the new business realities, don't be afraid of such a change. Once this decision of how to model the business logic is made consciously, and you're aware of all the possible options, it becomes much easier to react to such a change and to refactor the implementation to a more elaborate pattern. Now let's talk a bit more in depth about CQRS. Historically, CQRS is closely related to event sourcing. In almost all cases, you need CQRS if you are doing event sourcing. But it's crucial to understand that event sourcing and CQRS are not the same. Instead, there are two conceptually different patterns. Event sourcing is a way of modeling business domain. CQRS is an architectural pattern. It allows you to represent, represent the same data in different persistent models. For example, for event sourcing, you have the event store for writing and projections for reading. Same data <coughs> in different models. We found that CQRS can be very beneficial for all kinds of business domains, even for those implemented as simple transaction script or active records. In such cases, we found ways of doing projections out of the persistent state. 
and by using CQRS, we tackled lots of complexities in the marketing context. Despite the fact that the vast majority of the business, business domains in this bounded context were implemented as active records. And finally, let's talk about bounded context. Context. At Internobos, we've tried quite a few strategies for decomposing a system into bounded contexts. First, we tried linguistic boundaries. We split our monolith into marketing and CRM contexts to protect our ubiquitous language. Next, we tried domain-based domain -based boundaries. Most of our business domains were implemented in their own bounded contexts. For example, crunchers and bonuses. We also tried dedicating a bounded context for a single aggregate. This approach had very limited success in the Marketing Hub project, but later on we extracted a lot of business entities out of the marketing monolith into dedicated bounded contexts, and in this project this approach worked much better. <coughs> and finally, we also shown, I also shown you how we dissected and aggregated into two different bounded contexts. This decomposition strategy can be called suicidal boundaries and don't ever try this at home. <laughs> but seriously, as this paper says, correct boundaries are important for peaceful coexistence of systems and teams in our case. So after trying out many ways of doing it, I want to show you the strategy for setting the boundaries that we are using right now. As Uri Dan said, finding boundaries is really hard. There is no flowchart for that. And this statement has some profound implications. Since there is no flowchart, the only way of finding the right boundaries is by making some trial and error work yourself. Which means, by definition, there will be mistakes. There is no way around it. So let's, let's acknowledge this and only make mistakes that are easy to fix and try to avoid doing the fatal ones. In our experience, it's much cheaper and safer to extract a bounded context out of a bigger one than to start with a bounded context that are too small and merge them later. Therefore, we always prefer to start with bigger contexts and decompose them later, as more knowledge is acquired about the business. Now, how big should the initial boundaries be? The logic is the same. Our heuristic right now is the less you know about the business domains, the wider the initial boundaries are. So for more complex domains, start with bigger boundaries. But for simpler ones, like supporting subdomains, you can start decomposing a bit earlier. When we've tried to decompose to fine-grained bounded context early on, as in the case of Marketing Hub, we ended up with a distributed monolith. On the contrary, as I said, in the marketing context, it started up as a monolith, but it was decomposed later on. We extracted campaigns, publishers, creative catalog events into separate bounded contexts. And it's evident even here. The simpler the domain is, the, m the more narrow are its boundaries. Hence, our policy is start with bigger boundaries and decompose, if needed, as you gain more domain knowledge. So those are the five practical advices I wanted to share. Ubiquitous language is not optional. Domain types change. Embrace these changes. Use them to make your design stronger and more resilient. Learn the ins and outs of the four patterns of modeling business logic. Use CQRS to represent the same data in multiple models. And start with bigger boundaries and divide as you gain more domain knowledge. To sum it all up, I will quickly summarize our current approach to implementing domain-driven design. We always start with the ubiquitous language. To protect the language, our initial decomposition strategy adheres to the linguistic boundaries of the language. For each domain, we decide how it will be implemented by following the simple heuristics I've shown you. And from this design, we deduce the types of business domains at play and verify them with the business. And finally, as more domain knowledge is acquired, 
we decompose the bundle context even further into more fine-grained micro microservices, but only if there is a good reason for decomposing them. If we compare our, our vision of DDD now to the one we started with, I would say that the main difference is we went from aggregates everywhere to ubiquitous language everywhere. And since I started this story about our company, Internobus, I told you how it started, so I'll share how it ended. <laughs> Today, not long ago, our biggest client acquired us. And of course, I cannot say th that we succeeded because of DDD, but DDD allowed us to succeed despite the fact that all those seven years, we always had too few developers and we were always what we call in Israel startup mode. In the rest of the world, people call it chaos. <laughs> so that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now or during the break. So uh, looking back, do you, uh, do you wish that you had uh, start read the whole book or uh, read more? Or do you think <laughs> it's good that, that you experienced it yourself and learned from that? That's a hard question. I, I don't know. I don't know, but I really appreciate this learning experience. I think it allows us, allowed us to learn more deeply about the of design, so I don't know. I think. More questions? One, two, three. No more questions. Thank you so much.